Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to use the lectern because if I stood in the centre, I would tell you lots of stories. And at about 10 minutes into my presentation, I wouldn't have moved off slide number two. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to be uh, focused uh, and get to the end of my presentation. I'm going to introduce an EU-funded research project that started about nine months ago, looking at how cities and city regions need to respond to disaster events. The project is part of the Horizon 2020 framework, um, and its, its issue is to link actions at individual organization level to the effect that those actions have on the resilience of the community post-disaster event. I'm going to try to persuade you in the next 15 minutes that it's actually facilities managers that play a key role in disaster resilience. But in order to do that, I'm going to have to take you out of your comfort zone. And I'm going to try to challenge you to think about facilities management beyond people, which is where we started in the keynote, to think about how your actions affect society. We heard about the profession, and we heard about the ranking of the profession, and we saw the list of the top ten professions. And as I watched that list, even though I can't remember everybody that was on it, one thing jumped out at me. All the people on that list, all of those professions, have a direct impact in one way or another on society. Even the footballer has an impact beyond the team. I think facilities managers need to think about their role in the wider society. And at the end, I'm going to ask you to join me, because the reason I'm speaking to you is I need your help. Because the project is 42 months long, we're six months in, and although I know we need to challenge facilities management thinking, I don't know how to do it. So what I want is to recruit some experts from this audience over the next three years to help me. But to do that, I'm going to give you the context of the project. So the research challenge, the context, where did we start? Cities are becoming larger. They are becoming e increasingly more densely populated. And if they suffer a disaster, the impacts that that disaster has become more severe. Some numbers. Don't hold me to these because depending on which source you read, the numbers change. Tokyo. 38 million people in the greater Tokyo area. Shanghai, 34 million people. In Europe, London, 14 million. Paris, 12 million. Madrid, 6 million. It is suggested that the first 50 million person city region is probably only 10 to 15 years away. That is a country in a city. And the impact that disasters will have at that sort of scale become magnified. So what we are trying to do is to look at how we can start to mitigate the adverse impacts of disasters on cities. So you have two pictures of disasters. First one is a flooding scenario. And this was my first introduction to resilience. I modelled what would happen to London as a consequence of an extreme weather event in 25 years through climate change. And as a consequence of that, I discovered that even though lots of organisations had business continuity plans, had disaster recovery plans, they'd never tested them against such extreme scenarios. And when we did test them, they all failed. They would not deliver what the organisation believed they would deliver. And thus, the facilities managers in those organisations had a false sense of security. They thought they were better prepared than they actually were. The second example is of liquefaction. Now, liquefaction is a very specific application or consequence of earthquakes. Low-grade earthquakes can cause the earth below buildings to lose all its strength. Water comes up through the earth and it's like a liquid. So even though buildings may be designed to resist the shaking and therefore don't break, if the foundations give way, they can sink and in fact they topple. And that's a real photograph of liquefaction. It was liquefaction 
that caused the most severe damage to the business district in the Christchurch earthquake um, of about six or seven years ago. And we've never known liquefaction in Europe, but in, in Aquila, in Emilia-Romagna, they've observed liquefaction for the first time. So we went to the EU, to the Horizon 2020, and said, look, we don't know what the consequences of this sort of event would be on a region like Emilia-Romagna. We don't know how to measure the issues, and we don't know how to deal with them. We do have some guidance because the United Nations have been thinking about all disasters for a number of years. And they produced the Sendai framework. Sendai is the city in Japan where the, uh, the discussions were, were framed. And they looked at the impact of disasters on the community, on people. And in this presentation, I want to introduce Sendai to you, um, but look at how it challenges facilities managers and look at how we need to start thinking about what we do in order to respond. This is an EU project, so there are certain things that I have to do. I have to tell you about the project. The project is called Liquifact. I will give you the web link later in the presentation. It's a 4.95 million euro research project comprising 11 universities and private companies across Europe and including representatives from Turkey. And it's looking at how we can improve the resilience of buildings and critical infrastructure to liquefaction. Our partners comprise engineers, geologists, geographers, IT organisations. But it's been led by facilities management. It's been led by myself from Anglia Ruskin. And the key challenge is a facilities management challenge. It's a challenge to build a toolbox to support critical business decision making. The challenge is to come up with uh, ways of measuring vulnerability, resilience, mitigation, uh, adaptive capacity, business models, cost-benefit models, in order to allow those who design new buildings or commission new buildings, or those who deal with refurbishment and maintenance of existing buildings, to evaluate what they can do, when they could do it, how much it would cost, and what the benefit would be. Now, if you look at that purely from within the context of a single organisation, it is unlikely you will take any action because the costs far exceed the benefits. However, when you look at this wider link to community and society, then I suggest that the calculation might be different. So the issue is one of the business case. So what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes is to take you through the first six months of the project where we have established the arguments, the theory behind which, or upon which, sorry, the, uh, the project is based. So I'm going to explore the concepts of vulnerability, resilience, and adaptive capacity. I only have one slide. I'm not going to take you, this is not a lecture uh, that I would give to my students if I was back at the university. I am going to present you with a model of resilience that is generally accepted as the start point. And I'm going to do that because at the end I'm going to map facilities management actions back onto that model. Going to look at the principles of Sendai because that's the United Nations framework for framing all of these discussions. And then I'm going to present you with a theoretical resilience assessment and improvement framework which seeks to integrate the principles of Sendai with what we understand as built asset management. And then I'm going to ask you for your help as we explore the meaning of this. So, vulnerability. The likelihood of exposure to a hazard or hazards and the adverse consequences resulting from them. Resilience. The ability of the system, physical, economic and social, to prevent, withstand, recover and learn from the impacts of the hazard or hazards. An adaptive capacity. The ability of the system to change, to adapt, to meet the new conditions brought about by the perturbations that fundamentally change the system. So it's the ability to move forward. And these three concepts, because that's what they are, they are not things that can be directly measured. Um, they're not variables. These three concepts are interrelated. And they're interrelated and also interdependent. So if we try to understand these concepts, we need to think about the space they occupy. They have feedback. 
So one value of one concept affects the others and vice versa. So they are not simple linear problems. They are complex problems and they exist in a complex space. Some people would describe them as wicked problems. So we know there's a problem space, but we can't tell you what the problem is because the problem varies depending upon the perspective that you take in order to view it. So within a space, there can be an infinite number of expressions of the problem. As such, no single solution exists, so we need clumsy solutions. And the theory and concept of wicked problems and clumsy solutions is not new. We've been working on it for 15 or 20 years, particularly in climate science. But if I tell you as a facilities manager that I can't quite describe the problem um, and I'm not quite sure what the solution is, but I sure as hell know it's your problem and I need your solution, how do you start to think about framing that? How can we turn that question or those questions that legitimately a CEO could ask of their FM department when considering disaster resilience into practical guidance that can be used to make investment decisions? And that ultimately is what Liquifact is trying to do. Luckily, we have a start point. We have a theoretical model. This is not mine. This is a model developed by Professor Susan Cutter from University of South Carolina. And it's the generally accepted start point for resilience. It basically argues that every society and every organization has antecedent conditions. These are combinations of their built environment, their social structure, their natural systems, which give them an inherent vulnerability and an inherent resilience. It's the start point. We all have that, but we don't often measure it. We then have an event, a disaster event. We are choosing liquefaction. It could be any event. It could be natural or man-made. It could be a cyber attack. It doesn't matter. Liquefaction is just the context to allow us to develop the thinking. The impact that that event has on, on the individual organization and the community can be moderated or exacerbated by the coping response. So by your disaster management plans or by your continuity planning. But ultimately there is an impact and the impact can be absorbed by society and if it is absorbed then recovery is quick or it can exceed the ability of the system to absorb it and uh, 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 recovery is slow or in some cases non-existent. So we have a challenge of a wicked problem and a clumsy solution in the context of a model which says that we have adaptive capacity and we have to use that in order to move forward. So I want you to hold that diagram in your mind. I'm going to come back to it in about five minutes. So where does Sendai fit in? Well, Sendai is basically a very large document, 100 plus pages, which give a guidance as to how organizations and city-states and city regions should consider approaches to reduce the disaster risk in terms of loss of life, livelihoods, health, economy, physical, social, cultural, assets, businesses, etc. So it's what can we do to improve the ability of a, a system to resist those issues. And there are some guiding principles. Disaster risk reduction is a shared responsibility between governments, authorities, public and private sector and stakeholder. So everybody has a role. So what is your role? What is our role as facilities managers? When managing disaster risk, consideration should be given to protecting people, health, property, livelihoods, as well as productive cultural and environmental assets. So it goes beyond the organization to the wider hinterland within which the organization sits, to the wider space that the organization occupies. Oops. Disaster risk reduction depends on coordination mechanisms within and across sectors. So it's not just organizes, yeah, organizations having their own continuity plans, but how do they talk to their partner organizations, their supply chain, the local authorities, the other responders, the other actors, other stakeholders in the space that they are occupying. Disaster risk reduction needs to consider multiple hazards, because rarely do you get one hazard. One hazard leads to cascading hazards. So you might start with a single impact, but it moves on. So how do you go beyond that? And that's where the wicked problem, clumsy solution comes in. 
And disaster risk reduction is more cost effective than post-disaster response and recovery. So build back better philosophy reinforces future risk. So how should facilities managers respond when asked to invest in things that might never happen in order to improve resilience of something that they might not fully understand? And that's the challenge that we're taking forward. Within that, there are four themes. Understand the risk. Use reliable data. Strengthen your disaster governments, governance to manage the risk. Have clear plans. Invest in disaster risk reduction to improve resilience and enhance disaster preparedness. All of those activities, you could argue, are within the realm of the facilities management organisation. Definitely if you exist within the public sector, but also in the private sector. So, what are we doing? Well, we're looking at integrating that framework within built asset management. And that's the model we started from. That was the flooding model. Not going to go through it in detail, but effectively understand your current position. Predict what might happen in the future. Identify and evaluate contingencies which might be physical or might be operational. They might be uh, building focused or service focused. And then plan and integrate them into a framework. And that was our starting model for flooding. And what we've now done is extended that model to resilience, uh, to liquefaction. So there, that's the resilience framework. That's the theory that pulls all of this together. It's a little bit complicated, but if you think about the big green box, that's a system. The system I'm showing is a healthcare system. Within the system, you have individual assets. These could be buildings on a site, or these could be multiple sites in a region. Within each asset, you have antecedent conditions. What is the hazard threat? Are you at risk to an earthquake? If not, don't worry, don't go any further. Are you at risk to cyber attack? If not, don't go any further. What would the impact of that hazard be if it actually happens on your asset? And what is the level of risk that you as an organisation are prepared to accept if that happens? If it does happen, the impact on the asset is a cause. It's not the end point. What's of importance to the community is your ability to continue to deliver your service. So if you're a hospital, in an earthquake scenario, you need to be able to deliver emergency care after the event. If your asset is damaged, you can't do it. So the impact on the building is what you see, but the impact on the service is what is important. How do you measure the performance level? What is your performance level? How might that be? What scenarios do you use? Do you have an extreme scenario that you've tested against? Do you have a likely scenario? What can you do to mitigate? Can you reduce your vulnerability, either physically, by stopping the event affecting your building? You can't stop an earthquake, but you can minimise its damage. Okay, five minutes, I'll, we'll get there. <laughs> or do you need to change your service delivery model? Is there another way of delivering your service? that can actually mitigate. Once you've identified what you can do, how much is it going to cost and how can you prioritise it? Remember we're in this wicked space, so there's no one size fits all. So how do you develop the business case? What are the cost benefits? And then how do you sell this going forward? So that's where we are. What we need to do next is I need your help. Because that's theoretical, that's not been applied. What I want to do is to apply it. And if we go back to Cutter's model, you can superimpose the various steps onto the model. So we can work out the antecedent resilience of a community with its infrastructure, with its organisations. I have a model for that. The UN produce it. We're going to develop four models. We're going to develop a susceptibility model, a risk model, a vulnerability model, and a resilience model. But I need your help in developing these, because I can identify what I think are the theoretical factors, but I need you to tell me whether in your context they actually work. Because ultimately I need to show an improvement. Because if I can't show an improvement, I'm not benefiting society. If I'm not benefiting society, I'm not achieving the objectives. So that's where we are. We're looking at physical attributes, your buildings. We're looking at operational attributes, your services. We're looking at organisational attributes, your management systems. And if you're interested, in getting involved in the project, there are some brochures outside which you can pick up or you can go onto the website and we would like your help. 
because we're going to try this out in Emilia Romagna. So there's the challenge. Think beyond the organisation. Think beyond what it is that you're doing now. Think about the role of a facilities manager from the point of view of your impact on society. And please, get involved in the project. Thank you.